All right, everybody, I want to welcome you to our Saturday afternoon wealth creation course. Uh, yesterday was Christmas, so we give everyone a, a day off, and uh, we're going to pick up today on what would have been our Friday night course. Now, um, for those of you that are just tuning in, if you were here last week, we talked about um, we talked about a couple of different things. We talked about how uh, we're having taxes and inflation essentially steal our wealth from us without us knowing. And then we talked about the repercussions of that. We also talked about how to handle that and what the solutions should be, right? So, so those are kind of the things we're picking up on this week. If you're just tuning in for the first time, uh, my name is Jerry. I'm the owner and founder of Wealth Dynamics. And uh, what I do is every week I deliver a free financial course. Okay, so we talk about things like investing. Uh, we talk about things like taxes. We talk about things like money. Right? And I've been doing this for about three years now. And the purpose of this course is to create financially uh, educated individuals and families. Okay, schools don't teach financial education, right? College doesn't really teach it. If they do teach it, it's a bunch of uh, overly scholastic, non-applicable information that really is coming from people that aren't winning with finances. So when we look around us at like trying to understand money and finances, we're not really getting that information as we come up in life. And that was a problem for me personally, okay? Because I grew up in a family where uh, money was not a good thing. It was not a positive thing. We had, you know, tons and tons of problems on the topic of money. My parents got divorced over it. Uh, when I was eight or nine, I watched us lose our house, our car, uh, homeless that summer living in a tent. And so those were all things that I saw at a very young age on like bad effects, right? So we've talked before about cause and effect. So those were bad effects of money. So I mistakenly looked at that data and I made the conclusion, if money is causing all of these bad things in my life, then money must be bad, okay? Like as an eight-year-old, that was what I was seeing. Not a, not a totally off conclusion because that's what I was noticing. But the fact of the matter is finances don't have to be hard, okay? When something is hard, for me, it's because I'm stupid, right? So when something is hard, it means that somewhere I'm stupid, I'm missing information, I'm missing data, I don't understand something. And it's not supposed to be hard, because at the end of the day, money is just math, right? And, and it's not easy to confront that, because we, we, again, learn a lot of this stuff from friends and family and our peers and our teachers and all these people in life that we pick up this information from. And so it's really hard for us to look at, well, what if all those people were wrong? or misinformed or miseducated, or they, they lacked understanding on something with this topic. So what we're going to do today is we're going to pick up on part two, okay? Part two of our series, how our wealth is being stolen from us, okay? So last week was part one. Uh, we talked about taxes. We talked about inflation and how that system is actually linked together, right? How, they, how the, the, the Federal Reserve Bank utilizes that, the Treasury utilizes that in order to siphon wealth from the everyday person back into their pockets, Right, so that was what we covered yesterday. Today, we're gonna to cover two different topics. Now, we're gonna cover information today from my book, How to Create Wealth, okay? How to Create Wealth by Jerry Feta. So if you guys are on Facebook, Instagram, Zoom, YouTube, whatever, wherever you're watching from, if you have a copy of the book, we are going to be on today, page 36, okay? So page 36, if you don't have the book, you can go to jerryfeta.com and you can grab a copy. Um, again, that's jerryfeta.com and the book is called How to Create Wealth. So if you have the book, grab it. We're on page 36. And I want to share with you today's topic because part of my backstory is I used to be a financial advisor. So I used to sell stocks and bonds and mutual funds and retirement accounts and annuities and all of this great stuff that really every financial advisor in the world is selling. It's all the same thing with a different brand, right? And I thought it was the way to go. Okay, I thought that that was what, what, it, what investing was. It meant that I bought a mutual fund from American funds and I put my cash into it and it was going to earn you know 12% because over, over the last 50 years, that's what Dave Ramsey said it's going to earn. And if I just keep doing that, then I'll be fine. Okay, Now, the problem was for me as a financial advisor, I didn't start in the financial industry until 2012. Okay, So I started in what's called a bull market, meaning the market, the stock market was going up right? Bulls charge, the market was charging up. It was just going straight up. There was like all this stuff that happened in 2008. I missed. 
I was still in school when that happened. So I didn't have money in the market. I didn't experience that. It wasn't real to me. Plus I lived in Alaska where we really didn't even have a 2008. Okay. Now the reason that's a problem is because as a financial advisor, just getting started, I saw only the good. Okay. I saw only the good stuff. I didn't see any negative stuff. There was no, um, there were no bad indicators for me. There was nothing that I could look at to make me think that maybe there's something else that I should be doing because everything I was seeing was perfect. I was putting people in these funds. They were making money because everyone was making money. And if you weren't making money from, you know, 2012 onward, something was wrong because people were just making money. Right. And so that was something where I had to start to research. Now in 2016, a movie came out called the big short. Okay. The big short, it talks about what happened. Excuse me. It talks about what happened in 2008. So in 2016, this movie drops. I watch it because it's about finances and I'm interested in it. And I basically see a very, uh, you know, kind of popularized Hollywood version of what happened in 2008. Okay. Now the movie was not fictional. Like it actually, like sure they had some Hollywood stuff in there, but the basic premise of that movie is hundred percent true. Like that's actually what happened in 2008. So here I am watching this movie, right? Selling stocks and bonds and mutual funds. And I see basically this mass fraud purported in the financial industry from, from probably 2004 onward through 2008, and nobody did a thing about it. Okay. And when people found out about it, instead of reporting it or trying to stop it, they found out how they could take advantage of it and make money on it. So I'm sitting here watching this. Now in that movie, uh, there's a character, he's the broker. Okay. He's, he's the broker. Uh, I think Ryan Gosling pro- plays him in the movie. He's going around pitching the inside deal to everybody. He's saying, Hey, if you buy this and this and this, um, I can sell it to you. It's going to be a hot deal. You should get in. And at the end of the movie, he's narrating the entire thing at the end of the movie, it finishes. And he basically talks about how none of the executives in wall street went to prison and how he didn't lose any money because he had no skin in the game. Right. So I'm sitting there watching this and I realized I'm freaking Ryan Gosling. I'm the broker. I've got no skin in the game. I'm selling this stuff to people. And if if something bad happens, nothing happens to me, they could lose all their money. Okay. So I started then looking at, am I actually doing the right thing? And, And I didn't jump to the conclusion of no. Instead, I researched. Okay. So I read more books. I watched more documentaries. I really studied what is the stock market and how does it work? Okay. So prior to probably midway through, I'd say June or July of 2016, prior to that period, if you would have asked me, Jerry, what is the stock market? Okay. I would have told you that the stock market is the way for the everyday consumer to invest in the American economy. And I would have told you it's the greatest thing ever and that it always goes up. And if you just put your money in for the long haul and diversify, you're going to be fine. That was my outlook. Does that sound familiar? Because I think sometimes when I post stuff that's anti-stock market, Okay. People think I don't think those things, or I don't know those things guys. I preached all that stuff. So any, any, you know, buy low because it's on sale, just hold on because the dip's always going to go up, just diversify. Like I was the one that was teaching that. So it's not like I've never had those thoughts before, right? I had those thoughts probably more than the average person did. But what I realized was that's not necessarily true. So what I want to do here is I'm going to read a little bit from my book. Again, this is called how to create wealth. And I'm going to read you a chapter called How the Stock Market Works, okay? Now, today's segment, again, is part two of how our wealth is stolen from us. And part two of how our wealth is stolen from us is through the stock market. And there's two ways that this happens, okay? So I want to read to you first from the book because a lot of us have this very dressed up opinion of what the stock market is that we've learned from you know, financial advisors or influencers or radio show hosts. And we've never actually looked at the data for ourselves and come to our own conclusion on what is the stock market, right? So I'm going to share with you, like, I used to be totally like tunnel vision. The stock market's a good thing. And I was repeating all of this advertising and propaganda that I had learned as a financial advisor. When I finally stepped back to look for myself at what is the stock market, what I saw is what I wrote in the book here. Okay. So check this out. This is the problem with the stock market. So um, there's two different ways to invest. So this is the first thing. So there's ways that we can invest. There's two different ways. The first way is we buy something and then we hope that someone is willing to pay more for that thing than we paid. And then we sell it for a profit and live off the profit and then hope we don't run out of money or things to sell. Okay. So I want to break that down. That's the first way. And this is how most people invest. 
right? So I'm going to sketch this out. If you guys are on Instagram, unfortunately, the Instagram does not link with Zoom. So you won't be able to see my whiteboard. Okay. So this is called appreciation investing. Uh, my whiteboard is still being ridiculous. This is called appreciation investing. Okay. So appreciation investing looks like this. And again, if you guys have questions, drop them in the comments. We're talking about investing today, how, how we can invest better and how most common investments actually are ways of, of us losing money. It's wealth being transferred from us to the people that already have the wealth. So this is called appreciation investing. Okay. So number one, we buy a thing. Number two, we hope thing goes up in value. Okay. Number three, we sell the thing for a profit, right? And number four, we then live off the profit. And then number five, hope we don't want to run out of money or things to sell. Okay. So these are the five steps of appreciation investing. This is stocks guys. You buy a stock, you buy a freaking mutual fund or Tesla or Bitcoin. You hope it goes up in value. If it does, you sell it for a profit. Then you live off the profit. And then you hope you don't run out of money or things to sell. Okay. Cause if I run out of money, I'm done. If I run out of things to sell, I'm done. So that's called appreciation investing. That's how most people invest. They buy stocks, they buy mutual funds, they buy ETFs, they buy cryptocurrencies. I'll go ahead and disclose. I don't buy any of that stuff. Okay. I own nothing in the stock market. Zero. I never will. Okay. So that's, that's appreciation investing. And this is what stock investing looks like. Now I want to break this down because it primarily is stocks. So when we invest in stocks, I want to kind of break down what this actually is, right? So when you're buying a stock or a bond, the first thing that you're buying and that you've got to understand is that you are buying something called a share. Okay. A share, a share in a company or share in a mutual fund. So you're buying a share, right? Now, what is a share? A share is ownership stake in a company or a fund. Okay, I'm some kind of owner in the, in the company or the fund. So I'm going to read this again from my book, How to Create Wealth. Okay, this is page 37. So it's called, What is a Share? A share supposedly represents an ownership stake in a company. It is a paper certificate saying you own the business to some degree. Okay, so that's what a share is, right? Now, I go on to say, but do you really own it? So let's reassociate the concept of ownership and pretend the ownership rules of a stock or a share are congruent with the rules of owning a car. Okay. So let's say that I own a car, right? If I own a car, we've all owned this before a car. I own it. It's mine. I can drive it. I can sell it. I can do whatever I want with it. Um, and I have total control over it. So when I think ownership, that's what I think about. Okay. Now with a share, it's not necessarily the same thing, right? So what happens with a share is I might own it. So we're going to call a share paper certificate of ownership, right? But here's the rules. When I own a share, number one, someone else votes on what happens to my, my share, right? So someone else can vote. We'll call it on, out, on outcomes, right? So basically, if I own a share, let's say in Coca-Cola, right? Sure, I have a share, but the board of directors doesn't give a crap what I think. They're not going to come to me and say, hey, Jerry, how should we run Coca-Cola this year? They don't care, okay? Like, we, like, think about, like, when somebody gets a share of stock in a company, that's one side of the transaction. What's the other side of the transaction? The other side of the transaction is a company that's raising money, okay? Now, they're not raising money through sales, right? This is, this is where the disconnect is for me. If I was broke and I came to you and said, I try, I'm trying to expand my business and I don't have money to, can I have some? you would be immediately skeptical. Okay, you'd be like, well, well, why don't you have money? You have a business. If it's successful, why do you need mine? Right, can't you just use your profits, right? So when a company is selling shares of stock, they're actually raising money. Okay, think about it, they're raising money. It's the same thing as borrowing, except with shares of equity, they have no obligation to pay it back. Okay, now if I was raising money and I said, hey, I need money for my company, can you extend me a loan? but I want the rules of the loan to be that I can default and not pay you back and nothing bad happens, you would not be interested, okay? But that's all a share is. A share is a company that doesn't have money, that needs money to expand because their sales can't support their expansion. And so they're going to borrow it from the general public through the introduction of selling shares. 
And when you buy a share, there's no, there's no promise of anything. Okay. So when I buy a share though, what I'm actually buying, right? So I'm not getting any control of the company. So let's say we apply this to a vehicle. What if I bought a vehicle, but somebody else controlled what happened to my vehicle? Okay. That's not buying that's renting, right? If I buy a car, I control the outcome, right? But we're saying with a stock, when I buy a share of stock, someone else votes on the outcome. The, the board of directors votes on the outcome. The majority shareholders vote on the outcome. Okay. So that wouldn't apply. Like with a car, I wouldn't buy a car if that was the deal. Right. So the second rule of investing in stocks is this. So again, how to create wealth. This is on page 37. If the share is sold or liquidated, the bondholders, preferred owners, and the debtors are paid before you. In fact, you are the last person to get paid. The proceeds will likely be gone by the time it comes to you. So this is how a stock, a stock works. If the company goes broke or sells, Okay. First, they've got to pay their taxes. They've got to pay their, their, their wages right off the top. Okay. Then they have to pay their bonds. Okay. Bonds mean that they borrowed money from somebody and secured it with something, whether it was equipment or payroll or whatever. They've got to pay their bonds off, right? Once they pay their bonds off, then they've got unsecured bonds that are due next. Then they have preferred shareholders. So there's actually a preferred club that gets paid after that. Then they finally pay out the common stock shareholder last if there's anything left, right? So imagine saying I own a car, right? So if sold, I get paid last. If the money is there. So let's say I buy a share of stock, just like I would buy a car, right? I buy a car, I sell the car, I make the money on the car. That's how it works. But on this, I'm saying if I buy a share of stock and the company sells or goes broke, there's a chance I don't get anything. And if I do get something, I'm freaking last in line. Last. Right? So what do I actually own? I don't have any control over what happens in the company. If they sell or go broke, I potentially get nothing, but I definitely get paid last. Right? So that wouldn't work with a car. The third rule is that the car could disappear due to insolvency and you are owed nothing for your ownership. The share works the same way. Okay? So could disappear. Imagine buying a car that could just disappear, right? Like I wouldn't feel comfortable driving a car that could just disappear, right? I go to the dealership, right? I, I get the keys. I sign the paperwork. I'm freaking excited. Anyone that's bought a new car knows the new car feeling. I get in, I turn the ignition and poof, the car is gone. I'm sitting in nothing. Okay. So a share could disappear. Anyone that's ever lost money in the stock market knows that this is the case. In March of 2020, everyone saw this happen. Your share dropped in value and disappeared. Okay. So the car could, could, could never disappear, but the share could. So what do I really own? If it could just leave, what do I really own? The next rule of investing in shares, right? Again, these are all my personal observations. Uh, so the, the share might pay you income as a thank you for owning it, but that is not guaranteed. So when you buy shares of stocks, they have something called a dividend. Okay. So they have something called a dividend, meaning that the company every year, they're going to set their, their benchmark for profitability. And if they exceed that benchmark, they can return that back to you as a dividend. Okay, they can say, hey, we made more money than we thought we did. We're going to give you a portion of this as a reward for investing. Okay, now that's not guaranteed. So let's say that I bought a car. Again, like if I'm buying something for income, it's a definite thing. I would want it to be guaranteed. If I'm buying a car that I'm going to rent out on Turo or I'm going to use for Uber, right? I would want to guarantee that if I rent it, I'm going to get paid. Otherwise, I wouldn't buy it, right? But with a share, I buy it with no guarantee that I'm going to get paid. Now, here's the other thing that happens. Dividend rates are something that uh, are something that can be you know either high or low or non-existent. So when a dividend rate is high, a company does something called a stock buyback. Okay, so let's say let's say that they have a share of stock, and that share of stock is yielding let's say a four percent dividend. Okay, so if I have a hundred thousand dollars in this stock, it's going to pay me four percent. I'm going to make four thousand dollars a year in dividends, right? Well, what if this company has let's say a billion dollars in shares issued? Okay, 4% on a billion is expensive. So some companies, and this is what they did in 2020 or 2019 prior to the market crashing, some companies look at that 4% dividend and they say, man, that's expensive. 
we could borrow money for cheaper than 4%. Okay. So that's what they do. They go to a bank. They say, Hey, can you issue us a billion dollars in loans? And the bank says, what are you going to collateralize it with? They said, well, we're going to purchase stock and we'll collateralize it with that. But can you issue us, issue us a billion dollars of loans? So the bank will, the company now has a billion bucks and then they go buy their, their stock back from all the shareholders so that they don't have to pay the dividends. Okay. Now what that does in turn is it inflates the stock price because we now have a billion dollars rushing into the stock, right? So now the stock price looks more expensive. The company saves money, their profit margins go up and the shareholder gets screwed because they didn't get the dividend that they tried to get. Okay. So the dividend is not guaranteed. Imagine buying real estate for the purpose of earning income and then finding out that there was no income you and I would be pissed. We wouldn't invest anymore, right? We'd want to pull our money out, but that's what the stock market does. Okay. Now the other rule, rule here with owning shares of stock is that you'll pay fees. Okay. There will be fees every single year that you pay for the privilege of, of owning the share. Okay. So these are called annual management fees. This is mostly for mutual fund investors, ETF investors, financial advisor clients. If you're just on your E-Trade account buying stocks, you're probably not going to pay management fees. You're just going to pay commissions. But most people don't do that. Most people work with a financial advisor or they own mutual funds or they have an ETF or they have a 401k and they are paying annual management fees, right? So imagine I buy a car, cash, right? Walk out of the dealership. It's free, clear, paid off. It's mine. But then I find out that every year I have to pay the dealership a fee for the privilege of owning the car that they just sold me. What? Like, like that doesn't make any sense. So, so this happens with stock. This happens with shares. I have to pay an annual management fee. Now, guess what? The fee is guaranteed. The fee is guaranteed. We just said that the growth is not guaranteed. The dividends are not guaranteed. Okay. The, the fact that I might even just get the money out that I put in is not guaranteed. So I could lose my money, but the fees are guaranteed. The only guarantee in this transaction is that Wall Street gets paid. Think about that. So this is a big reason I don't invest in stocks. Another rule of owning stock, <laughs> the, car, the stock is invisible and you can't actually do anything with it, right? Invisible and can't do anything with it. What can you do with a stock? Proxy vote? You send in a little slip of paper voicing your opinion? That's it. You don't get to, there's, you don't get to have a piece of the company. You don't get to walk into Apple and, 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 and tell them you're a shareholder and get any special privileges. You don't even get a discount on an iPhone if you own, own stock in Apple, right? So the share is invisible and you can't do anything with it. So again, <laughs> imagine buying a car that was invisible. Like you bought a car, you have a piece of paper that says you own a car right? But somebody else controls the outcome of your car through a voting system and your vote doesn't really count. If your car gets sold, you get paid last before or after everyone else in line gets paid. The car could disappear at any moment. You bought it so you could rent it out on Turo, but there's no guarantee that you're actually going to get paid if you do that. Plus there's annual management fees that are guaranteed that you're obligated to pay. And at the end of the, the day, the car is invisible and you can't do anything with it. Would you buy a car? Okay. Now I know that this sounds crazy because this is not what's talked about, right? This is not when we hear about stocks, we're not pitched any of this stuff. Okay. We hear you can own a piece of the American economy. We hear this company has a strong track record. We hear that the dividends have been consistent. We hear that the market's going to go up because the outlook on the economy looks great. Like these are all the plus points, but let me show you all the out points. Okay. Someone else votes on the outcomes of the share. I don't have control. If it's sold, I'm paid last. I don't actually have any guarantee of anything. My money could disappear. My dividends aren't guaranteed. I've got to pay fees the whole time I own it. It's invisible and I can't do anything with it. Okay, that's, that's the rules of ownership. Now, before any of this, we actually have to understand too, like how does the stock market work, right? So when you're buying a share, you're buying something called post IPO meaning that this is on the retail market. If you buy a mutual fund or an ETF, these are publicly traded stocks, okay? IPO means initial public offering, okay? Initial public offering means that a company is brand new, right? Brand new, they go public and then everyone can buy their shares, right? Now, with the system of stock ownership, there's something called pre-IPO, meaning before the companies are issued publicly, they can do something privately, right? 
they can go to they can go to Barron's, they can go to Lehman Brothers, they can go to Goldman Sachs. Well, they can't go to Lehman anymore, but they used to. They can go to Goldman Sachs. They can go to to, to any one of these major banks and say, "We're going to go public on the market." Before we do, do you want to get in? Okay, it's very important to look at this. So before you bought shares, and before anyone could buy shares, there were pre-IPO sales of a company. Okay. These are the big boys. These are the, the hedge funds. These are the, the institutions that own and run American, right? They own and run the American economy. They get in before everybody else at the cheapest possible price because nobody else can buy. The way that stocks work, it works as, as on a basis of call, called market displacement. So when you think about like, if you've ever been in a pool, what happens when more people get in the pool, right? The water goes up. Right. Same thing happens when the stock market goes up. So when more people get in, the market rises, prices rise. Right. So if I'm a buyer, I would want to buy before people got in. That's called pre IPO. So I can, if I'm a giant institution, buy these stocks before anyone else is allowed in the pool, which means I'm getting in when the water is at its lowest point. No one has gotten in yet. Right. And then I buy up, you know, several hundreds or tens of millions of dollars of this, these shares. Then it's, Post IPO, the, the the general public can then invest. Everyone starts getting in the pool, and I catch the benefit of the water rising. Okay, now when mass buying happens, the market goes up. When mass selling happens, the market goes down. Okay, so what happens when the market gets to a certain point, and all these companies that bought pre IPO have hit their profit indicators or their stop loss, and they say, okay, we're going to get out now. Like this, this was our target. We've hit our target. We're now going to get out. Guys, these, these are called market makers. When this happens, the market crashes. So think about in March of 2020, who can remember a giant list of CEOs, Disney, like all these guys that sold their, 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 their uh, executive ownership in their companies. Some of them even stepped down after that happened. A lot of us forgot this even happened. This was in March and April. Right. So in March, we had like the CEO of Disney step down, the CEO of Harley Davidson step down. All these guys started selling their shares. Uh, what happens is the market crashes. Right. These are all guys that own significant amounts of stock and it drives the market down because the net selling is greater than the net buying. Okay. So here's, here's what happens. And, I, and my Zoom is probably not going to do us justice because it's, it's messing up on the, uh, on the, on the drawing board here, but I want to draw this out a little bit before we, we get too much further into this. So we have down here at the starting point, this is pre-IPO. Again, IPO means initial public offering. So these are all the big boys that are getting in before anybody else can, right? And so they buy, and then we launch and we go IPO. So initial public offering happens. And the price of that stock goes up. Okay, and it might go up and down and up and down, but the general trend is up because more and more people get in. Okay, so we have these guys here that are pre-IPO. We've got the IPO, the general public, and then we have also the issuer of the stock, right? So down here, we've got the issuer, which is if it's a Disney stock, Disney is the issuer, right? If it's Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola is the issuer, okay? So we have people that have vested interests in this stock prior to us ever getting in. Right. We have freaking Barron's gets in the stock before the IPO. Okay. Not only that, but Coca Cola held some back for themselves. So a lot of people will buy the stock. They don't realize there's multi billion dollar corporations that have controlling interests in this stock that they're, they're in it for their profit. Right. We think that the stock market is this open economy, like the average everyday investor can get in and win. No, no, no. It's a freaking, it's a scam. Watch what happens. Pre IPO, you get in, the market rises. These guys say, okay, we're done. We're going to sell market tanks, right? What happened is your money transferred to them. All of this money that got in, all this money that got in that drove the share price up, as soon as it sells, it's no longer the money is gone. It's just the money went to the guys that sold, right? So realize when you lose money in the stock market, you're not just losing it. It's going to somebody. Okay, and the somebody that it's going to is the person that got in before you, the guy that sold it at a profit, right? Now, when this happens, you're here at the bottom holding it. And what are you told? You're told it's going to come back by low. It's on sale, right? Really what's happening is these guys are replacing themselves with you. They got out. There's a bunch of free shares now and they're saying, hey, go buy more. So you're like, okay, let me go buy more. And, and you end up buying more and you end up pushing the market back up. 
Okay. Now here, the issuer says, man, we have all the issuer knows they can't screw the pre IPO guys, right? They can't screw Goldman Sachs. They can't screw Barron's, right? But they can screw you. Okay. Because you're not their buddy and they don't have to go to go to a board meeting with you next week. So when the pre IPO guys are here, we talked about share buybacks. They're not going to do share buybacks with their pre IPO people. They're going to do share buybacks with you. So when the pre IPO guys are out, these guys, the issuer, and when you've propped the market back up, are, they're going to say, hey, the dividend that we're paying on the common stockholder is too expensive. Let's do a buyback. So they're going to go borrow some money. They're going to get into debt. They're going to take that debt, and then they're going to go buy the shares away from you. Okay, effectively pushing the stock price up, but lowering your dividend. Your percentage of dividend goes down now. Okay. And then what happens is the market keeps going up until it crashes again. And then you're told, go back into it. Now, here's the deal of what's happened in 2020, right? So in, 20, in 2019, this was happening, right? In, in third and fourth quarter of 2019, the amount of stock share buybacks by corporations is stupid. You can go research it. Trillions of dollars in buybacks, okay? Now, the buybacks happen. The companies buy all, all their own stocks, they cash the investors out of it. They lower the dividend. The profits go up, right? And then what happens is March of 2020, the market tanks, okay? All of these Fortune 100 CPOs are, are, are CEOs are selling their shares, getting out of the market, okay? Now these companies are saying, we're broke. We can't afford to stay in business. Government, we need money. So the government obliges and gives the money, right? And then that drives the share price back up. Now, here's the effect of that. This is why I say this steals wealth from you. When money is printed, and this kind of connects with our lesson last week, when money is printed, we have a dollar, we have goods and services on one side. We have goods and services. My Zoom is still being ridiculous. I might need to get a, a new keyboard feature goods and services. Okay. So the prices on goods and services go up, right? That's you and me. That's gas goes up. Groceries goes up. Rent goes up. Housing payments go up, right? So it's not a good thing for us, but guess what? Share prices go up too. So what effectively is happening if the price of stocks go up, and these executives and these companies own all this stock, okay? They're getting a financial benefit. Their assets go up, okay? But for us, life gets harder. Why? Because inflation pushed up prices too. Groceries cost more money. Gas costs more money. Cars cost more money. Now, when we buy these things, who are we buying them from? We're buying goods and services from these guys. So they get to raise their prices because inflation goes up. And then we get to spend more money with them. And then on top of that, they get the benefit of their stock price going up, right? So this idea of like investing in the stock market, it's a mechanism. This actually back in the 1930s, um, if you look at that prior to the 1930s, if you study this um, before the Securities Exchange Commission was formed, there was a, a problem in the market where, where companies would issue stock and then they would trade stock and sell it to consumers. And then they would use inside information to drive the price of their stock up. Okay. And, and they drive the price of the stock up. There'd be a bunch of oblivious consumers in there. And then the consumers would get ripped off because they didn't know what the hell they bought. The companies would then sell at a profit and then they'd take advantage of everybody that was in the market. So prior to 1933, I believe this is what was going on. Okay. Now in 1933, the securities exchange commission was formed. And basically that's what we know today as the sec. And they came out with the Securities Exchange Act saying that companies have to register their stock and they have to do all this stuff to where their government certified to make investors feel safer. Okay. But guess what? Nothing has changed. Okay. The only thing that's changed is now the government oversees it. But guess what? what guess what happens with the government? This happened actually in 2020. So these companies, basically, when they, when they break the SEC laws, guess what? They only pay fines. Okay. So there's, there's nothing happening to them. They have basically, let's say they, they violate one of the SEC laws and they have to pay a billion dollar fine. They just add that to their cost of goods. They say, okay, we're going to do this business transaction and this business transaction is going to cost us an extra billion dollars. So we just need to make sure that we make more than that. 
Okay, so they're going to add that to their profit and loss statement and their their cost of goods, a billion dollars in SEC fines. And then they're going to go about their merry way and make sure that when they break the law, they make more than a billion dollars. JP Morgan actually just did this this year. This happened in 2020. So JP Morgan rigged the gold market. So they rigged the gold market. They were trading in it. They broke a bunch of laws. They got caught and they had to pay a billion dollar fine to the SEC. Okay. So they paid a billion dollar fine to the SEC. They get caught and they, they admit to doing it. So they actually pay the fine. They're guilty. But in the American court system, there's something called double jeopardy. My screen is freaking out. There's something called double jeopardy where you cannot get tried for the same crime twice. Right. So they get fined. They pay the billion dollars. They now have double jeopardy and they go do the exact thing that they got fined for. And they make over a billion dollars in profit doing it. This billion dollars that they paid to the SEC is being looked at as a over the table bribe. Okay. Like you're the SEC, you get a billion dollars from, from JP Morgan. Do you really think the SEC is going to crack down on them? No, they're basically business partners. Okay. So, so JP Morgan rigs the gold market, shoves the pricing up, pulls the bottom out underneath. We have, you know, just a couple months ago, the gold price came down. That was one of the reasons why. They pay a billion dollar fine, pay off the SEC that they're going to be silenced. They plead guilty. They get double jeopardy and they can't get caught for what they're doing. And they go back and do the same activity and make a billion dollars in profit. Like, tell me that's a system you want to be investing in. It's not, right? Like if I was doing that, I would go to prison. If you were doing that, you would go to prison. If they're doing it, they just make sure that they pay some of their cut to the SEC. It's like the mob. It's like the mafia. Okay. So this is why I say like the, the stock market is one of the ways that robs wealth from us. And there's two distinct ways that we covered that it does that. So the first one is through volatility. Realize volatility is caused and created and it's done so strategically. Okay. So volatility means the prices are going up and down. So we just saw these companies, they will make the price go up so that you'll get in because people buy into the euphoria. Then they'll sell at the top. They'll get their profits. All of the money you put in the market will go to them. They'll crash it. And then you go buy low because that's what Warren Buffett says. Warren Buffett's a freaking shark, but you'll listen to him because he's a nice old man. Warren Buffett says to, so you go buy low and then you prop the market back up and it repeats. Volatility transfers money from us to them. When, when, when the market crashes, it's not these multi-billion dollar companies that are getting hurt. Okay, it's the people in the pension fund. It's the people with the 401k. It's the guy with the E-Trade account. Like it's us, Right. And then the second way that we get our wealth stolen from is fees. Okay, I want to show you what I mean by this. So the first thing I want to show you with volatility is check this out. So if we have, and on Zoom, guys, on, on uh, Instagram, if this is confusing for you, move over to Facebook. If you go to Jerry Feta, you can see my Zoom screen. Um, I'm going to be doing an illustration. So if you can't see it, it's not going to make a whole lot of sense, right? But let's say that we have 100 grand invested. We've got it in fund A and we've got it in fund B, right? So we've got over a five-year period, let's say we've got this money invested. Okay, this blew my mind when I learned about this. Again, I was a financial advisor, so I didn't know anything about this. So let's say we have $100,000, right? In year one in fund A, we make 50%, right? Where's my percent button? 50%. So we go plus 50% in year one. Great, right? That's exciting. We just made 50% in the market, our 150K. It just went over to, to, to or 100K went over to 150, right? Year two, though, we lose 50%. Okay. So that's not fun, right? We just went from 100K to 150. And then we went from 150 to 75, right? Now, year three, Let's say we gain another 50, right? Year four, we lose 50 again. And then year five, we gain another 50. So we're looking at this, right? We're seeing our returns. We're averaging these out, right? So we average this out. We made 50. So we're up 50. Then we're down 50. Up 50, down 50 equals zero, right? Year three, we're up 50. Year four, we're down 50. Up 50, down 50 equals zero. Year five, we're up 50, right? So we made 
And if we take 50% over five years, 50 divided by five is 10. So on paper, it looks like I made 10%. I'm feeling pretty good. Okay. But check out the math on this. I'm going to share this on my calculator so you can see what actually goes on here. Um, it looks like I made 50. I feel like I made 50. But if I look at my account statement, let me show you what actually occurs. If my calculator will open up. Here we go. So year one, we said we've got a hundred grand to start. So we've got our hundred thousand dollars and we're going to multiply that times 1.5. Okay. So we're going to go times 1.5. Okay. So we made 50% in year one. So we're up to 150,000 year two, we lose 50%. So we're going to divide this by two. Okay. So year two, we're down to 75,000. Not as fun, but year three, we make some money back. Let me get rid of this other calculator. So year three, we make 50% again. So we go again times 1.5. Hang on here. Let me get this correct. So we have 75,000 times 1.5%. So we make 50% of year three. So now we're up to 112.5, feeling good again. We've got more than we put in. Year four, we go down half again, right? So we're down to 56,000, not so hot. But remember I said we, we made 50% in year five. So we take that and made 10% over this period. That should be good. So let's find out what happens in year five. Year five, we are up one and a half percent again. We make 50%. But we've only got $84,375 right? So how is it that on a 10% average annual return, because again, we had up 50, down 50, up 50, down 50 over that five-year period, it's showing that we made 10%, but our account balance is only 84 grand. Do you guys see that? Like this is actually the kind of crap that happens due to volatility in the stock market. It goes up and down and up and down and up and down. And we don't realize that we actually have less money than we started with. Okay. So this is the way volatility steals wealth from us. We put in hundred K it went up to 150. Somebody sold half of it went to them. Okay. When you stop thinking about, I lost money and you start thinking instead about, no, no, I didn't lose it. It, it went to someone else. So all of these years I lost 50%. I did not lose it. Like definitely it just transferred. It went to another guy. It went to somebody that got in before I did that had more money that could have more, more, uh, potential uh, sway on what the market does. Those are called market movers or, or, or uh, market makers, right? So that's actually what can happen. Now, the other thing too that we talk about is fees. I'm going to show you guys what fees do. So that's volatility. Now, this is what I'm going to show you guys now is called an investing calculator. And I want to show you cost of fees. Now, fees are something that, that really kind of sneak up on us because we don't see them on our statements. If you own mutual funds, try and find out what your fees are and you'll see what I mean. It's the most difficult thing in the world to get a straight answer on, okay? You've got your prospectus and your fund statements and those have some fees. Then you've got a statement of additional information and those have some fees and there's all these fees in there. But it, there's not like a single place where you can just look and say, hey, all of the fees you pay add up to this number. That doesn't exist. So let me find our fees calculator. Now, the thing to look at with fees and the thing to understand is fees compound. Okay, fees compound just like compounding interest. Okay, mutual fund expense calculator. Here's what we're going to use. So this is just a, a, a normal financial calculator. I use this sometimes to look at, at different analysis on funds, but I want to show you guys what I mean here. Um, fees, though, they compound just like interest does. So if I'm earning a 10% compounding interest rate, then that means that every year my, my interest rate is going to build upon itself. If I have a 1% annual fee or a 2% annual fee, the same thing occurs. So this is an example. We're just going to say we've got $10,000 invested. Let's even give it an 8% rate of return, benefit of the doubt. We're going to hold it for 30 years. Uh, let's say there's an average of a 3% commission we pay every time we put money into it and that the total 
fees annually are 1.5%. Okay. So check this out. When I look at this, if I look at 1.5%, doesn't seem like a lot of money, right? Like if I look at that, it's like, okay, that's a, that's a small number. I can live with that. I'm making eight total. So the difference I keep, that's still good, but let's look at the actual numbers on this, right? So our chart we have here, we have the fund balance. Okay. So the fund balance, I've got 10 grand over 10, over, uh, I think we did 30 years. Yeah. Over 30 years. So over 30 years, my 10 grand turns into $62,000, right? Now my fee of one and a half percent, if you look at the purple bar here, and the blue bar, and we combine these, I paid a, a 3% commission every time I buy a mutual fund. Okay. And then I pay, pay a one and a half percent annual operating expense. So I'm paying 25,000 in annual operating expenses. Okay. And then I'm also paying uh, 13,000 here. So that's, that's like two thirds of my value. Do you see that? Like a one and a half percent annual fee just by itself just by itself, one and a half percent annual expense fee comes out to about a third of what I'm making, a little more than that. I make 62,000, my fees cost me 25. Okay, and the reason being is again, compounding interest means the interest compounds upon itself. On a mutual fund, when I pay fees, it's, it's 1% or it's 2%. Every year my account grows, my fees are based on that amount. So every year my account goes up, so do my fees. If my account goes down, I still get charged a one and a half percent fee or a 2% fee on the balance. Okay, so people don't realize this, like, like Wall Street's double dipping. So at the end of the day, like we're watching this, I'm gonna open this up for questions here in a minute. At the end of the day, if we're watching this, there's, there's a couple of things I wanna get across to you. If you're investing in the stock market, number one, you should only be investing in the stock market if you're in the right group. So the first group of people that can be doing this is professional traders. Okay, so if you're a professional trader, meaning you are trained and profitable and you know how to day trade in the market, those are, those are who do well in the market. That's not most of us, okay? And I don't mean that you got an online course from some guy on YouTube that's teaching you how to do options trade. I mean, you actually can trade, right? So if you're a trader, more power to you, get in the market, okay? If you're also a institution, you're a financial institution, the market is designed for you. Okay. If you are an issuer, the market is designed for you. Okay. If you are a market maker, the market is designed for you. These are the only four groups that should be in the stock market, professional traders, financial institutions, issuers, and market makers. Okay. Mom and dad in their thirties with two kids don't fit into any one of these groups. I don't fit into any one of these groups. You probably don't fit into any one of these groups. Okay. The reason why I isolate this out is the professional trader they can make money no matter what because they're not buying and holding. They're actually taking advantage of the system. They understand the movements and share prices and how to trade that. So if I'm a trader, I can go make money regardless of what happens because I'm not buying shares. I'm trading them, right? If I'm a financial institution, I can buy pre-IPO or I can buy controlling interests in companies, right? So if I'm a Goldman Sachs or if I'm a Barron's or if I'm a Bank of America, like I have the the wherewithal to actually like put enough in the market to actually have something substantial in there. This is what Warren Buffett is. Okay. Warren Buffett puts in enough money that he has sway in what Dairy Queen and Coca-Cola and all these other guys do. So he's not just a, you know, a, a retail guy buying an S and P 500 fund. He's actually going in there and buying 10 or 15% of a company and they listen to him. Okay. Or if I'm an issuer, the issuer is the guy that actually owns the company and is raising the money. Okay. Again, issuing stock by nature means that a company cannot afford its expansion. If a company cannot afford, afford its expansion, then I'm not going to give them basically 0% interest money. Like think about this entire concept. I don't have, I said, like I said at the beginning, I don't have money to expand. So I tell you, I need to raise money through issuance of stock. If I don't pay you back, you don't get anything. I'm not going to guarantee you anything. And you're going to pay fees to do it. What loan have you ever done that works that way? If, if you're loaning me money, let's, let's think about when you bought your house, okay? When you borrow money from a bank, how does that transaction work? You're borrowing their money, okay? You're paying them a fee to borrow their money. You're going to pay closing costs and origination costs, right? If you don't pay them back, they take away the house. There's an expectation that you pay them a certain day every month. That's guaranteed. So they're not looking at a house and a mortgage and saying, this is risky. But when you loan money to Wall Street, Instead of, because now they're borrowing your money, instead of them paying you a fee to borrow your money, like you would pay to a bank on a mortgage, somehow they flipped it. 
you pay them a fee. You want to loan us money, you're going to pay us a front end commission. How does that work, right? And, and, and if they don't pay you, nothing bad happens. And instead of them paying you guaranteed interest, you pay them guaranteed interest. Like how did they flip this on you? So this is why I say the issuer, the issuer is one of the groups that is successful in the market because they're the one actually making the rules. They're the one issuing the stock. They've got no skin in the game. Okay. And then finally, the market maker, these are, these are funds and individuals and companies that have enough money, like a Warren Buffett, where they can go into the market and they have enough sway where they can actually like make the market, right? Like, like if Warren Buffett were to sell a stock right now, the stock would go down because Warren sold it. Okay. So these are the only four groups that should be in the stock market. If you're not one of these groups, I don't recommend being in the market. I know everyone at work says it's a good idea. I know your financial advisor says it's a good idea. He gets paid to say that. Everyone at work is working with them. So they're going to, of course, need third-party validation that they made a good decision by getting you into it too. They're going to feel better if you're one of their friends and they're in the same thing with, with you and they got you in there with them, right? So these are all the four groups that should be in the market. Anyone that's not in one of those four groups should not be in the stock market. doesn't matter who you are. So- that's what I wanted to hit today. I'm going to open this up for questions. We're going to do actually the same thing we did last week. So if you guys are on Zoom, uh, drop the questions in the comments. We'll answer those live after we've covered Instagram and Facebook. If you guys are on Instagram, I'll answer your questions first, um, just because you do have, a, I think, a 60-minute timer before Instagram shuts off. So let me see what questions we have on Instagram. <laughs> Brock says turning into Bruce Wayne more and more each live. So Brock is making fun of me because I haven't had a haircut since February, but Bruce Wayne is kind of a badass. So I'll take, I'll take the compliment. Um, let's see here. Josh says, please say hi, Josh. What's up, Josh? Good to see you. Again, if you have any questions about stocks, bonds, mutual funds, any of the stuff we covered tonight, drop them in the comments. If you're on Zoom, uh, I will answer your question live today. We've got people from Algeria, Chile. Thank you guys all for jumping on. I know it's a change of schedule day after Christmas, um, but it's great to see everybody on. Let's see. No questions on Instagram so far. Nope, nope. Let me just see if we might find a, a golden nugget on Instagram. I don't think we're going to. Someone says, bro, will you please help me find a girlfriend? <laughs> Just so you guys know on Facebook and Zoom, this is the kind of stuff we have on Instagram. Uh, path of learning, love your knowledge. Do you have any information regarding a sacred account in Europe? That's a good question. So path of learning, we don't have a sacred account in Europe yet. Um, if we do, I'll let you know. We have it just in the US right now. We can also do them in Canada, but not in Europe at this point. Okay, no questions at all on Instagram. That's unfortunate. So we're going to go and turn Instagram off and hopefully that kind man can find a girlfriend. Let me tell you what though, if he knows about money, it's going to be a lot easier for him to find a girlfriend. That's for sure. Okay, let's see what we have on Facebook. Uh, Justin says, Merry Christmas. Good to see you, Justin. Merry Christmas, Aaron. Uh, Vanessa, good to see you. Uh, Aaron says, what about government bonds? So Aaron, if you watch my course from last week, you'll find out about government bonds. Government bonds is the United States government borrowing money from the United States treasury and using that to get into debt to create currency that we then are obligated to pay the interest on via our income tax. So if you ask me, the government bond is, is literally the biggest Ponzi scheme in the world. Um, and it's the reason we have income tax, you know, because it's linked to the the U.S. Treasury borrowing money from the Fed. Aaron says, is the stock market better than a savings account? No, they're both terrible ideas. I wouldn't put money into either of them. Um, Justin says, this is, this is why 
I shifted to private placement investing into tangible assets that cash flow. That's a good deal. Um, so Justin, I did the same thing. I used to do mutual funds and all that stuff. Now I only do gold, silver, uh, and private placements. Uh, Kevin says, are you investing into any real estate? If yes or no, why or why not? Uh, so I do invest in real estate, but I don't do it traditionally. So I don't buy rental properties and then manage tenants. Um, I loan money to investors, like large funds that are going to buy uh, mobile home parks, multifamily real estate, storage facilities. And I'm basically the mortgage. I don't want to deal with tenants. I don't want them to call me any day and say, hey, uh, you know, so-and-so didn't pay or the toilet doesn't work or this doesn't work or we need a shovel. Can you sign this invoice? I don't want to do any of that. Um, so I do it as a lender. And basically that means that I'm going to loan you money. You're going to pay me every month guaranteed. And if you don't, I'm going to take your thing away. Um, and that's the extent of it. So that's how I invest in real estate. Uh, Evo says, so is Warren a day trader or a market creator by creating the market to be volatile? So I would say Warren is a market maker. Uh, Warren does not do a lot of trading. Warren does a lot of long-term investing, like buy and hold type stuff, but he buys in such quantity that he definitely has uh, market making capabilities. If you watch it, Warren Buffett, he'll go on Twitter and you know if he tweets something about a stock, just that tweet can move its share price up and down. Okay, so, so it's definitely a case where he's a market maker. And if you watch Warren, Warren always publicly advises for the general consumer to do one thing. And then if you watch him, he does the complete opposite. Okay, so Warren understands market displacement and he understands that more people in the pool equals higher water. So his advice is always gonna be focused around getting more people in the pool because then there's more people that he can get money from. Um, so keep that in mind when you're watching and listening to Warren. Uh, Aaron says, thanks for the free game. Let's get dollars this year. I got a job at a gold firm starting January, January 50K annual. That's awesome, Aaron. Uh, Kevin says, what are your thoughts on Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad principles? Uh, I could take them or leave them. I'm not a huge Kiyosaki fan. Um, you know, he's, he's got a lot of stuff out there. You know, I think it's more up to your own opinion of what you think about him. But I look at what's simple, what's true, and what's applicable. And I like stuff that's simple, true, and applicable. Uh, Justin says, do you invest in syndication so that you have availability for upside? Probably less than a loan up front, but has a bigger upside. I don't do a lot of syndication. My thought is more money now is better than more money tomorrow. Um, and with syndication, it's not even the statement of more money now is better than more money tomorrow. It's more money now is better than hopefully more money tomorrow. So a syndication means that they're going to pay me smaller interest up front for potentially a bigger upside on the back end. For me, that is speculation. So I would rather charge a eight or a 10 or a 12% interest rate and get nothing on the back end and get more money today and then invest that money that I'm getting in higher cash flows now to make more overall. Um, and that's just a time value of money equation that makes sense for me. Um, excellent questions today, guys. Okay, that's all I see on Facebook. Let me see what we have on Zoom. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Okay, we've got a couple questions on Zoom. So I'm going to switch my microphone over really quick. That cracks me up. Brock said I, I look like Bruce Wayne. I'm going to have to start talking like... So uh, real quick mic check. How do I sound, guys? Can you see, hear me okay on the mic? Sound is back. Perfect. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, go through on questions. And if you're on Zoom and you have a question, we'll go live and discuss your question. Um, first one I see here is Bryson. So Bryson, what I'll do is here, I'm going to go ahead and pull you up on Zoom. And I'm going to unmute you. And... Uh, You'll be able to ask your question. We could talk about it live for a couple of minutes and then we'll move on to our next one. All right, good. So let me get everything set with my speakers and then we're gonna turn Bryson on to ask his question. All right, good. So Bryson, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. 
Oh, but I think Bryson is gone. Okay, so we'll hit our next question. Okay, next question is Nano. So Nano, let me go ahead and pull you up and I'll take you off mute here. All right, good. So we are live here with Nano. Nano, let me know when your uh, mic is on and you can hear me. All right, Nano is still on mute. All right, so we're going to hit our next question then. Okay, next question is from Vanessa. So let me go ahead and turn Vanessa on. Hello. Hey, mm -hmm. Vanessa, how are you? Hey, I'm doing so good. Merry Christmas, Jerry. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Thanks. So what, yeah, what is your question today? Well, I just didn't understand what exactly that JP Morgan did this year in 2020 that was illegal to where they had to pay a billion dollars out to the FCC. Yeah. So they basically rigged the gold market. And what that means is they uh, artificially increased the prices. And so they kind of jacked the prices up, did a bunch of trading, made a bunch of profit. And so that would be considered an illegal activity. And that's what they actually got in trouble for. So they just made a different price. So there's a standard price of gold. And so they just changed the price of it to make more money. So not, not as arbitrary as that. What they did is they went in with a bunch of money and pushed the market up on purpose. So they basically flooded it. Like I talked about market displacement, when more people are in the pool, the water goes up. And so they caused that to happen. And then as a byproduct of that, they then traded inside that market and kind of took advantage of it. And so that action was Ill illegal, and that's what got them in trouble with the SEC. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah no, no problem. problem. Okay, good. So let me see what other questions we have here today. We have – okay, Dave has a question. So we're going to go live with Dave here. Let me see if we still have Dave. Here he is. Hi, Jerry. Hey, Dave, how are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you, sir? I'm good. Did you have a good Christmas? I did. Did you? I did. Thanks for asking. All right. You too. Hey, uh, my question's regarding your new bullion uh, business, I'll, I guess, for the lack of a better word. Yeah. Uh, is there any way to set up a automatic... I guess I'm wanting to start to buy some silver also. Is there any way to, to set up an automatic account where you can pull from my checking account every month and buy bullion at a certain price and then have it put into the vault that we're starting with the gold? That's an excellent question. So we do have that capability. So you can put an auto, auto withdraw, auto deposit, and every month we can either take it out and send it to storage and keep it in your vault, or we could ship it directly to you depending on how you're buying it. If it's inside of a retirement account, then it'll go straight to your vault. Um, and then if it's something that you're doing outside of the retirement account, then you can have that shipped directly to you and we'll just auto ship it out every month. Yeah, it would probably be out. It would, wouldn't be in a retirement account. I probably just would just get it shipped to me then. Perfect. We could definitely do that. Yep, we'll uh, we'll discuss that at some point in time here real soon when you get it when you get a better opportunity. Awesome, that sounds good. All right, let's see what else we have today for questions. Okay, good. That's all the other questions I see on Zoom. I do see a few more on Facebook, so let me answer those. And uh, if you guys are on Zoom and you still, you do, still have do have questions, drop those, drop those in the comments. We'll answer those, those real quick before we sign, sign off, off today. today. Emil says, what would, you do if I, what would you do if you lived in Europe and had 80K in cash? Uh, Emil, so that is kind of an open-ended question. I'm not sure what the Europe markets are like. So um, depending on if I had debt 
I might pay that off. If I was inter interested and in, educated on the European market, I might invest in real estate or do private lending, one of those things. So I would definitely base that off of my own situation and what I knew and what I understood and where I was. Okay, Justin says, what are your thoughts on Bitcoin? I feel like the price gets artificially inflated uh, inflated there too with buying frenzies. So I'm not a cryptocurrency fan. I've, I have a video, let me fix my hair. I have a video on YouTube you can watch about that. So I'm not super into cryptocurrency. There's not anything that backs its value. So in my opinion, it's no different than a stock or, or you know, fiat currency. Like it really is just made up nothing. And um, basically when you look at a cryptocurrency, it doesn't produce anything either. So if it was invisible and produced income, I might be able to make sense of it, but it's invisible and produces nothing. So to me, it's got no actual value. Um, now it's going up because a lot of people are getting into it. Like I said, market displacement, the more people that get in, the higher the prices go. If you look back in the 1800s, the same thing happened with the purple tulip. So, you know, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, crypto will probably be a thing. Like I think that's going to integrate it into our finance system, but I think it's going to get hijacked at the central bank level. And when that happens, I think anybody that publicly uh, owns like a private or tries to create a private cryptocurrency, that's going to be looked at no different than counterfeiting. So if we have a Fed coin and I decide I'm going to make my own cryptocurrency, I'm now competing with the United States government by creating my own form of currency. And I think that's going to be looked at the same way. Okay, Edgar says, are stocks today used for owning a shares of a company? helping that company with cash or mainly for day trading capabilities in the stock market. So that's a good question, Evo. So when a company initially goes public, like we talked about initial public offering or IPO, they're raising money for their operations. So it literally means the company is trying to expand and does not have money to afford their expansion, which in my opinion is, is carriage before the horse, right? But they're raising money because they don't have money to operate with based on the operation that they're trying to expand into. And so that's definitely what it helps with. I don't think a lot of companies raise money just for the purpose of trading it, um, unless it's a fund. That, that this literally what a fund is. But most publicly traded companies are going to do it for operations. Okay, good. That's all the questions I see on Facebook. Let me check Zoom one more time. Okay, excellent. So that's all I see for questions on Zoom and Facebook today. Guys, thank you for tuning in. Um, if you have any questions, reach out to us. Again, if you would like to get a copy of my book, you can go to jerryfetta.com. You can grab a copy of How to Create Wealth. Um, if you go to our website, wealthdynamics.com, there's tons of information and content on there that you can go and use to improve your financial knowledge, uh, get connected with us and, and set up, you know, whether that be a sacred account or a blueprint or anything you'd like help with, you can reach out to us there. So thank you for watching. Make sure you all like, share and subscribe. And I will talk to you all next time.